It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Gavin Newsom, front and center, was giving a little spiel to the folks at Planned Parenthood. And and this is, again, something I've been saying for, oh, ever. Uh, where are the Democrats when you need them? Where's the Democratic Party? Uh, where the blankety blank are they in this moment? And uh, Newsom, you know, finally came around to that going, hey, where, where are my fellow Democrats? Where are they at? Where is the Democratic Party in this moment? Uh, he said, quote, we aren't standing up more firmly. Why aren't we standing up more firmly, more resolutely? Why aren't we calling this out? Uh, call it for what it is. This is a concerted, coordinated effort. And yes, they're winning. They are. They have been. Let's acknowledge that. We need to stand up. And where is the counteroffensive? And of course, he's talking about the draft the draft of the repeal of Roe versus Wade. He's talking about the response uh, of Democrats or lack, really kind of lack thereof, of a, of a real visceral response. Now you go, but no, Rick, no, no. There have been people who are, there's outrage. There are people who've got their signs. They, they were protesting, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, this is what happens. And this is why, this is why Democrats get beat up all the time. And this is not new. This is, this is pick an issue throughout the last 40 years. And why the working class has continued to take it on the chin time and time again. And why, honestly, why a lot of the working class has gone to the other side. Uh, I've said my basic premise, the basic thesis of my, my belief structure is the working class wants somebody they believe is going to fight for them. Even if you're fighting the wrong battle. They want someone who's going to you know ball up their digits, get in there and take a couple of take a couple of swings. And the Republicans have been that party. They're they're fighting the fight. I would argue they're fighting the fight to destroy the working class. But hey, you know, they're fighting. Where is the response? Now you go, but but Rick, this is this is what the Democrats do. There's a little little outrage. There's some people, who, and then they they figure it out. Then well, we we can get around this, and this is again. You you go back to January sixth. You go back to Janus. You go back to pick an issue, pick an issue that has has made the lives of working people worse. And then you look at the gauge, the response from the Democrats and the party and, and really the, we, the people, I, again, I don't blame only party leadership. I blame us as well. And the reason I bring this up, I saw Newsom's speech and I, I looked at, uh, at his statements and I coupled that with a, you know, a conversation I had yesterday with, with a young woman uh, that I ran into um, early twenties, uh, you know, Nice woman uh, working at a, a fuel stop, uh, you know, along the highway. Not overly concerned about Roe going by the wayside. Believed in herself. I'm not going to go back. They're not going to tell me what I can do with my body was, was her statement. Uh, I will. I will do what I have to do. Uh, very empowered. And, and this is a great moment. This really is a great moment for women to, to stand up and take that kind of, of, of empowering viewpoint, this empowering stance that, no, you're not going to, you're not going to shove me back into the kitchen. You're not going to tell me what I have to do. Uh, I'm going to lead my life and, and I'm going to fight for myself. And that is a great, that is a great position and good on her. But there's part of me that goes, I don't know when the entire legal apparatus is working against you. I, I'm not quite sure that that impassioned view is 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 going to be enough. I'm hoping, hoping I'm wrong. But but her view was is that you know I'm I'm not quite seeing, you know it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. 
the appearance doesn't seem to be that that big of a deal. We can just go to another state. We can go to somewhere somewhere else. We can we can figure this out. We can get we can get the uh, we can get birth control. We can get the Plan B. We there there are alternatives. There are workarounds. We've we've got technology. We're smarter. We're better. And I guess the idea being, and, and this is how I kind of I kind of threw it. I go so basically what you're saying is. They've let women out of the bottle and we can't get the genies back into the bottle is what you're saying. And she's like, yeah, we're not we're not going back. And, you know, it's, she was once once you move down this path of we're not going backwards. She got a little bit more militant, a little bit more demanding. These are my rights. And how dare you you know, even talk about the, the fact that you're going to take them from me without understanding that, that that's exactly what's going on. And I'm afraid, I'm concerned that 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 she is going to be the norm. Now, look, you know, a, a couple of conversations that I've had with younger women, not going to paint my view of, of the entire country. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do the New York Times, drop into a, a, a diner somewhere in the middle of nowhere, talk to two people and, and boom, magically, that's that's the entire community. But this is making me think a little bit in, in different ways, because I'm looking at, at the taking away of this right from women as a major step backwards, because I guess my mind works in what's coming next, all of the things that are possible of next. Uh, we've already seen in places like Texas and Missouri where they're talking about laws hunting people down. Uh, we're, you know, the bounty hunter laws. Uh, we're talking about, you know, Missouri, where they wanted to go after you if you cross state lines. You're talking about Louisiana, where, you know, I, I guess if it's murder in Louisiana, would it not be considered murder in another state? And if you came back, is this not something where you, there isn't really going to be the workaround that some folks think that there might be? And again, I come back to my initial premise of this is going to harm poor and working class women more than anyone. Because the wealthy, they're always going to get what they need. They're always going to get uh, the care and the, the legal protections that they that they want and need. It's the poor and the working class. It's, it's the people that I know who are going to struggle in this. It's my kids. And that's the angering part of this. And, and like I said, look, this, this isn't my issue. But this is an issue in that realm of this is being taken away under the guise of Family values. Uh, now, remember, the people who are doing this, these are people who have no real agenda. And this is where my frustration with Democrats is. My frustration in this is, you know, every time that this happens, there's no there's no real pushback. I mean, January 6th is a perfect example. You know, I've had a bunch of people say, but Rick, you know, if it's not a big deal. Where's the sense of urgency? I don't see... I don't see, you know, the politicians being all that urgent about it. We're, we're well over a year, you know, closing in a year, almost a year and a quarter away from when, when it happened. It's in the past. It's over. Not a big deal. If it was a big deal, they'd have done something immediately. Where's the urgency? This is my concern with this, is that we, we allow that kind of thinking that there, that there doesn't appear to be, you know, things shutting down, that there doesn't appear to be, you know, politicians, you know, making fiery speeches and rallies and, and all of the, 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 the display to give the appearance that this is a big deal. I'm concerned that that message is being sent. Because there are some who are saying, but, you know, this is going to be a giant earthquake politically and this is going to, you know, change the, the political landscape. I don't know that it will. Because the weird thing, and again, this is just one conversation with one young woman. Uh, I, I finished it off going, well, are you going to vote come November? You know, is this something that's going to get you to, you know, to go to the polls and, and hold someone accountable? Just, nah, I don't know. Didn't seem to be that sense of urgency. And, you know, when, when you look at this, now look, the polls overwhelmingly, you know, 66%, two-thirds of the country are saying that Roe should not be struck, completely struck down. Uh, almost 60% said Congress should pass legislation uh, to protect it na nationwide. I mean, that's in, in this day and age 
when you're getting up to 60 60 percent plus in this country to agree on something that's a bfd But the sad reality is, is, and this is where Newsom is right, this is a concerted effort. This is a well-planned, well-orchestrated, and has been for a while. Again, this is, there's nothing new here. This is what they've been doing for a very long time. My problem, again, is the response. We, we haven't seen the kind of response that we need but on a policy front or on a political front. Now, for me, there should be a, a flurry of policies coming out. Fine. You want to outlaw this? Then we start going ticking down. If you are if you want to force people to bring children into this world, then we're going to have to pay for them. We're going to have to get the prenatal care for mothers. We're going to have to get you know early childhood education for kids. We're going to have to get good on the list, You know, set up college scholarship funds. We're going to have to do all kinds of things. There should be a flurry of legislation to put Republicans, the family values people, on the record of, okay, you want people to be forced to have children that, that they can't afford, uh, that they're not ready for. You want to force a 13-year-old into having a child that you won't allow to get a dog license, but we're going to force them to have a child. How are you going to have that child, be ta that child take care of a child? Put it on the record. That's what should happen. But again, the Republicans have no idea how to how to legislate. They have no idea how to make people's lives actually better. All they understand are these culture war things to divide and rip us apart so that they can they can win elections. That's all they that's all they know how to do is make up crisis. All they know how to do is cause division and, and outrage and anger. They they know how to create problems. They can start fires like the best of them. But they can't put anything out. And, you know, as I was just thinking about this earlier, you you think of all of the things that they've that they've run on over the years. That mysteriously, you know, whatever happened to MS-13? Did MS-13 just up and close their doors and go home? Because there was like you know, six minutes where we were told MS-13 is around every corner. They're coming for your children. Don't let MS-13 steal your daughters. And then there were well, before that it was the the Islamic fascist terrorism. How did that go? Islamo fascist terrorism. What was Rick Santorum blathering on about? There was that. I mean, there was there's always a boogeyman, isn't there? There's always something to keep us afraid and and pitted against each other because they don't have an idea on how to make people's lives better. Their entire brand is about creating outrage. Their entire brand is about creating division. It's not about how do we how do we get along and how do we move forward. For instance, now, you know, a lot of folks are going, hey, you know, since Roe is now going to be overturned, and I've been saying this for years, the 20th century is under attack. All the progress of the 20th century is being repealed before our very eyes. You know, for me, the most prosperous working class in the history of civilization has been repealed right for, out from under us. Uh, they stole that from us. Our grandparents built it and they have taken it from us. They have stolen our children's birthrights of a, of a prosperous working class by destroying our unions, by destroying our rights to have a say on the job, by destroying our rights to have, a, have, have the ability to bargain for the wealth uh, that our labor creates. And look, you know, they... Democrats have been involved in that, too. And in the process of repealing the 20th century, you know what's coming next, because they've already begun to signal that they're going to go after same sex marriage. They're going to and they're already beginning that process, which is why I found it interesting that a group of Republican senators have now come up with this great idea that they want to be able to have uh, TV ratings for LGBTQ characters. So now we're going to have, we're going to have the gay, we're going to have the triangles. We're going to put triangles on TVs now. Oh, we'll have a triangle rating. Because that's going to be the next culture war thing. It is. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's insane. But this is where we're going. This, this is all they can do. 
because it's all they know. It's what their model is. It's, it's shoving outrage candy down the, down the throats of, of working class folks who are struggling. And, and, you know, people will take it. It's like, you know, I, I've said a bunch of times, you know, if someone's drowning and you throw them an anchor, they're going to grab onto it. Even though it's going to take them further down, deeper down. This is what's happening to the working class of this country. The Republicans, all they keep throwing us are anchors that keep throwing us deeper and deeper into despair and into the depths of depravity. And until we wake up and say, you know what, we want something better. We want better opportunities for our kids, for our families. We want a better shot to make sure that we can we can thrive and survive. Hey, how about some health care? How about better jobs? How about better infrastructure? How about better education? How about anything along that line? And what do we get from them? No, no, no. Silly people. You're more interested in who's marrying who across town. You're more interested in that 13-year-old girl who got raped, making sure that she has an opportunity to have a child as a child. How how absolutely grotesque can these people be? And then to look us in the face and say, we care about family values. We care. Yeah, you care right up until the time the kid pops out. And then, oh, 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 sorry, you're on your own. Man, pull yourself up by your bootstraps there, kiddo. It's crazy. It's, it's a crazy world we live in. Because what's interesting to me is not one of those family values, folks, who's going to force that 13-year-old girl into having a child or any any woman into having a child that they're not ready for or can't afford or don't want. Not one of them has come forth with a piece of legislation to say, here, here's how we're going to help. Not one. Not one. I'm waiting for it, though. Do you think it'll happen? Don't hold your breath. I'm going to take a quick break right back after this. You got thoughts, you got questions, you got comments, email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Let me know. Am I, am, I, am I on the wrong path here? Because, look, this, again, not my issue, but this is kind of my visceral reaction to it. Uh, share with me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. If you missed any of the program podcast, you can get that wherever you get your podcast or at the ricksmithshow.com. Back after this. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. I've been driving buses for five years, and my day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads. But I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. And the Teamsters pushed a lot. So we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind, the, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. I think this is one of my favorite stories of the day, uh, that uh, Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, evidently signed uh, a couple of tax breaks in the law that he's calling a, uh, a way to fight the Biden inflation headwinds. Uh, what's interesting, though, is while he's, he's fighting the Biden inflation 
Uh, he's doing it with the money that came from the $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package that came from Biden. I mean, this is the funny part. Here, the, walk, walk with me, if you will. Uh, it's the $1,400 that Biden gave to everyone that's causing all of this infl inflation, right? But it's the, now, you figure the logic here, the money that Biden is giving to the states that he's, DeSantis is evidently going to give away to corporate America and the very wealthy, that he's going to fight the inflation. I'm struggling with that logic. Anyway, here to share some thoughts on, on the logic and, well, on the Biden inflation. I've asked our good friend Mateus Bernango to come share some thoughts uh, on this. Mateus is a professor at Bucknell University where he specializes in economics and one of my economic guru guys that I go to. Mateus, thanks for taking time for us. Uh, thank you for having me, Rick. So, you know, am I, um, I don't know, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm struggling with this. Uh, Biden inflation. $1,400 to all the people. That's what it's caused. It's overheated the economy. We wasted all this money. And yet he's using money that Biden gave to states uh, to invest that that's going to somehow fight the Biden. Uh, am I missing something? Uh, so I, I missed that story. He, he's cutting taxes. He, a number of tax breaks they cut, they put into law. They're doing a bunch of that stuff, some corporate stuff. You know, they're, they're going down that way. And this is going to cut off the, the Biden inflation. This is, this is what this is. Well, that you know, the degree of confusion. The only, the only frightening thing I would say about this is that you know he's a possible likely candidate to, to the presidency. So, so the fact that that that's on, on the table is somewhat frightening. But yeah, in, in all fairness, uh, I mean, there's so many things wrong. Uh, the, the inflation does not come from from the rescue packages and too much demand. Uh, if anything, actually. There is a reason of concern. We have talked several times that my concerns are less with inflation, although inflation is a problem, of course. But with the consequences of what we do to fight inflation and the possibility of a recession looming and, and the first quarter of the year, the numbers for GDP were not good. We had a fall of 1.4 uh, in GDP. So so it's not too much demand. It, it's the and it's not. Biden inflation, you know, Biden has been unlucky to be, you know, the president when when the supply side shocks, uh, you know, happen and when the particularly the oil shock after the war in the Ukraine, you know, uh, really sort of hit energy prices. So, so the Santis policies, you know, won't do a thing. I mean, if anything, actually, if it was demand, if he was right, what he had to do was increase increase taxes uh, significantly. And as you said, if you're going to increase taxes in, in this country, you know, uh, you should increase it on the very wealthy that you know have not paid their fair share in a long, long while. So, so it is incoherent. It's uh, it's propaganda. We he knows better. You know that's the other part. Uh, you know the the Republican Party has been not just in economics. Economics is actually probably not the the most important or relevant of those things. Uh, using rhetoric that it's dangerous, it, it will lead to to you know things that will hurt all of us. So it, it's dangerous to play with it, this kind of stuff. Uh, you know. So so yes, I think he knows better, and this is just it's it's a joke. It's a yeah. joke. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, but again, it's it's the PR stuff, you know. And and look, you know, I've said for a while one of the things that DeSantis is doing is he's he's going to do some of the gas tax stuff. Took for a couple of months, he's taken the gas tax off. Uh, and using the money from, you know, from the, the federal government to pay for that. Um, you know, and look, I've been saying from the beginning, Democrats should have done that from the beginning. Uh, that that yeah. should have happened yeah. right away. Uh, so this, again, yeah. one of those Sub subsidies for that, it's 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 again, anything that helps people, you know, in that in, in this respect, it, it's a it's a reasonable solution. So fair enough. Although, again, you know, it, it should be uh, it should be clear that a lot of that will be done with federal money. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it just is what it is. Now, let's take a look at the job numbers. A good day for job numbers. Uh, now, me personally, when I look at job numbers, I always ask the question, great, we've, we've got a lot more jobs being created, 428,000 in the month of April. I want to know what kind of jobs those are. Were those service sector, low-wage paying jobs? Were those manufacturing jobs? Um, we saw a little bit of a bump in manufacturing. Uh, in fact, yep. you, know, you know, the Biden administration is saying that since they've taken office, we're almost up a half a million manufacturing jobs. I think that's a good thing as well. Uh, curious your analysis of the 428,000 for the month of April. 
It's good numbers, as you said. It seems to continue a robust uh, sort of recovery in the labor market. Uh, manufacturing was above 50,000, so I saw it this morning before I left, so I, I don't know. But it was a good, solid number. Uh, you know, the the uh, the recovery in that respect is good. We're closer to what we probably before the end of the year and before the you know the elections, we will have surpassed the level of employment. Not unemployment, employment is three you know point six or whatever it is. It's very low, but yeah, you know, I mean the the official unemployment. If you use the one broader U six in which you have the people that are relatively unattached to the labor market, it's more like seven percent. But you know, still. Uh, it's an incredible recovery. We're we're close to 1.2 million jobs or so below the peak, uh, the previous peak. Uh, uh, so so that part is good. Uh, the most important part is the the numbers in in the main category there between whatever uh, 24 and 54. Th- those numbers are really solid. So so uh, yeah, you know. Uh, the, the labor market is recovering. I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm reluctant to call it full employment because, you know, I think that, you know, uh, a, rec- a full recovery requires that you surpass the peak. This has been fast. That This has been good. It has been good and fast because exactly of those transfers that, you know, people now are complaining that are causing inflation and are not. You know, I mean, as we speak, you know, Shanghai continues to be, you know, sort of in lockdown. That's a good chunk of 40% of the Chinese sort of, you know, exports or something along those lines. So we're going to have, again, all through the supply chain issues associated to that. We're having still all of the issues in in Europe associated to Ukraine and, you know, the effects on the, you know, price of energy. So, So that's causing inflation. And so, uh, so, so we have, we have, uh, you know, uh, the risk that uh, you know th- this strong recovery that is reflected in the numbers today in the labor market, because of this other stuff that uh, has nothing to do. All of these things, uh, you know, I mean, w- one can discuss to what extent Biden is responsible for, uh, and could have done something different in on the Ukraine. But you know, definitely not my my area of expertise. But you know, but the point is, I don't think he has control uh, on foreign policy on a level that he can you know. Uh, manage you know the price of energy uh, on, on that level so so this is something that happens so stuff happens and 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 there is a we talked about this the other day there is no good slogan that's the part about this it's not an easy thing to market so how do you market you know that it's not your fault when people do see in the supermarket the prices of stuff or, or the gas pump the price is going up and so wh- what I suggest always is the concern of, of the, the government should be to try to help workers, you know, maintain their real wages up. So inflation is bad to the extent that your real wages don't go up. So right. helping the recovery helps them, you know, gain strength, bargaining power and, and to you know find good jobs that pay you know higher wages and survive this. So, so that that's the best that they can do. Uh, of course, uh, whether that will help in the in, in the you know in the midterm elections is another thing. What concerns me as an economist is that the reaction in the profession and the reaction of officials dealing with this, and I mean the Fed, has been one that I think at the end of the day will hurt uh, the economy more than than solve it. So we we have had you know this week uh, an unprecedented increase. It's the, the highest in 20 years increase in interest rates of half a percentage point it's still low interest rates but you know check mortgages and interest rates on those and those will hurt the middle class and people that are trying to buy houses for the first time and so on and so forth and and that will have an impact on 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 the housing market and you know and hence on demand and and on the economy and 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 it will hurt working people so so all 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 of that is is concerning because it suggests a scenario and we talked about this before that is like the 70s in the sense that we're going to put the brakes on the economy create uh, additional problems for working class people we're going to slow down this recovery that has been good uh, in the name of stopping inflation which it you know it won't do uh, that so 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 that's a problem i see that as a you know as a as a problem for the biden presidency and 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 a political conundrum that they better uh sort of square before before the election yeah. uh because otherwise his presidency it's basically 
over. No, because I, I think, you know, and look, I'm not the economist here. Obviously, that's you. But, uh, you know, I think they've misdiagnosed the cause of the inflation. I still keep coming back to the fact that this is about corporate greed. This is about opportunism. Uh, this is about, you know, everybody's raising their prices because they can. Uh, not because they're making the argument that wages have gone up so so much, that the inputs have gone up so much. Uh, you know, and I've given a couple examples over the last couple of weeks of, of places where th- prices have just gone up astronomically for no real good reason other than, well, we've heard, uh, and this is where, you know, I've heard, I've seen people go, should we be talking about price controls, which I don't, I don't necessarily agree with, but I did want to ask your thoughts of, I know it was something that came up back in the seventies since you brought it up. Is that something that eventually, uh, if we can't get a handle on this, that comes back, is that blast from the no, past? Price controls do work. So price controls do work. I, you know, they, historically they have worked. So the notion that they don't work is incorrect in my view. I, I in my blog, I have written on those things for over the years. So like 10 years ago, so <laughs> even on, on on how they were used during the, the war period and, and how they were used for, you know, certain certain periods uh, later on. And, and they, they have been successful. Of course, they have been successful in an era in which, uh, so for example, during the war, the the government had considerably more um, control on what was being produced. So if you, you know, GM wasn't producing cars, GM was producing parts for airplanes or whatever it was it was doing. And so, so price controls tend to be better when you have a certain grip on on the functioning of the economy and and when you can sort of manage certain prices. So. Um, I think it's possible to make it work. So I, I, I think government has the capacity to, but a lot of that depends on on political will and the ability to organize, you know, that that kind of effort. And right. and, and yeah. You know, uh, but now, given given the realities of where we are, though, Mateus. I mean, given the realities think, that you got Kirsten Cinema, you got Joe Manchin, you got you know Mark Kelly. That's what got... I'm saying. I, I don't think that that will happen. I don't think that that will happen. So. So I, I, I've been I've been writing on this. One of the things I wrote recently on the blog, and people were retweeting on this, is that my sort of view is that inflation uh, is here to stay. It's not going to be the inflation of the '70s, not two-digit inflation. So it's it's high inflation, but you know, from the '70s point of view, it's moderate. But yeah, it's high, and it's higher than we hadn't had for over 40 years, and it's it's with us to stay. And so, uh, for a while at least, because I think that the war in Ukraine, I'm sorry to say, seems to be something that will drag for a while, and the consequences of you know of trying to, you know, uh, constrain the ability of the Russians to 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 do more, uh, it will imply that uh, the oil market, uh, the natural gas markets, will be. So those adjustments are not, you know, short-term adjustments. So so this will be long-term uh, adjustments. Also. The disputes with China uh, and the chains in the supply in supply chain are not just about the pandemic. They're also about the fact that you know we lost five million manufacturing jobs to China over the last twenty years, and 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 there are clear disputes with China now that imply that American corporations, some at least, will change change where where we outsource some of the uh, production side so will go to other it, it, most of those jobs are not coming back by the way so trump was lying about that uh, and they'll go to other parts of asia but uh but those changes again will take time and that implies again on the supply side some costs and i, I do agree with you that there, there is there are elements here i mean there are certain things that are not the responsibility of, of corporations and you know like uh the price of oil it's just up. The, co- the cost of production didn't change, but the price went up, and they'll sell it. Uh, so the government should intervene. That's where the government intervenes, and and you know, and and taxes and create subsidies. So so we, we should be paying less at the pump. People should be pay- paying less at the pump, and that difference should be taxed uh, out of the of the corporations and and you know redistributed. But uh, but that won't ha- again. It's political and 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 the ability to do that i mean we don't have a bipartisan sort of this is not you know a congress that you know they can sort of sit and 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 do that kind of stuff so um you know the things that he can do uh, are are not directly associated to inflation so i for example i'm a big fan of the idea that he should, he promised i think he will do it i mean how much uh, some 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 uh, you know uh, that part and in student debt you know cancellation. So I think that there'll be some of that, 
And I think it's an intelligent thing to do. I think we have space to do it. So those that think we cannot do it, we have too much inflation, the government is already spending too much, that is too large. I think that that's all a mistake. I think we do have space. Uh, there's a lot of people hurting. The government is not close. You know, not even close. There's no such thing as this government getting broke. We're fine. And so uh, they should do something like that. It won't resolve, you know, the other issues, but it's something they can do. Yeah. And so, so, so the political constraints are, you know, and, and you know this. So, so uh, we're here talking about the economy. I'm sure you talk about, you know, the January 6th riot and, you know, and then the coup and all of this other crazy stuff. So, so I always say the economy actually looks reasonable, you know, <laughs> given all the other stuff going on yeah. in society these days. But it is somewhat crazy because we, we, you know, some of these things can be tackled, but they won't be tackled. So we, we, we don't have the, the, the sort of uh, political um, um, space to do, you know, what's reasonable, uh, you know, given given the constraints that uh, that they face in Congress. And again, this is one of those moments where, I, again, I blame us, the voters, for us having such a dysfunctional system of, uh, because you're right, we should be paying less at the pump. There should be more more action to move to reduce prices, to, to get things down so that working people aren't aren't put in this position. But again, I go back to my our friends on the right. Uh, the, the Republicans want this kind of chaos because they need it to be able to attack Biden. And and so they can have their, their silly little slogans. Uh, at, least, at least that's my view on it. But Mateus, uh, as always, I appreciate the thoughts, the expertise, and, and your knowledge on this. Appreciate the time. No, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. Always good stuff. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Tell me, tell me what you think. Should should gas prices be where they are? I've got, look, I've got some liberal friends who say, no, we should be paying what they pay in Europe, eight bucks a gallon. Um, I think that would really crush the working poor in this country. Uh, I think we should be doing a lot more to make it make it easier until we transition to something better. Quick break, right back. calling all builders your country is calling you tackling climate change is the job of our lifetime it's time to build back better let's get to work Yeah. Now that I've said that to Satan and his minions, let us move to the news. Conservatives are becoming cool. We're going to take sex education out of the schools and put it back in the homes where it belongs. The left controls big tech, big media. The left controls higher education. The left controls Hollywood. It controls big corporations. It controls big sports. Twitter is nothing. It's powerless. And how we really make it powerless is we leave. I want my Twitter account back. A lot of Americans have felt like mushrooms over the last couple of years. We can change that. We've endorsed JP, right? J.D. Mandel. Now, some people think this was a gap. I think this is just President Trump, Josh, hedging his bets. The former president's obvious, keen mental acuity. They call him me stupid. I think you voted for Trump in, obviously, 16 and 20. Would you vote for him again in 24? You know, I don't think he should be our nominee. Rather than yeah. talking constantly about the last I election. don't talk constantly, but you brought it up. You do, I didn't. you do. You brought it Come up. Come on, eat away. Excuse me. You brought it up, I didn't. I don't talk about it very much. I don't claim to be a journalist. I claim to be a talk show host. Right now, we're going outside this country to get things made. And they don't have the regulation, but we bring them back in this country where we get all the regulation and getting things made. The sex trafficking cabal where they make billions of dollars off of harvesting kids. There you can see it. Uh, it's very, very clear. Uh, it doesn't move day or night. It's demonic. It mm. is a satanic portal. Uh, it, it is mm. access to this earth uh, by those who are evil and only by closing it will, be, will we be successful in saving uh, this nation under God. Round up all the Muslim Marxists who tried to stage that coup, but General Flynn made sure that wouldn't do. Round up all the Hollywood petties and the mainstream media too. Your days of lying to us are through. As Vladimir Putin wages war, oil companies are making billions by price gouging us at the pump, and Republicans are helping them do it 
They took millions from big oil and blocked a clean energy plan that will lower costs for families. They're leaving us dependent on oil and at the mercy of foreign dictators. Congressional Republicans in the pockets of big oil against American-made clean energy. It all means higher profits for oil companies and higher gas prices for us. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So one of the things I hear quite often is, uh, you know, what we've turned in, turned into is a country split down the middle between the rurals and the urbans. And, and look, as someone who lives in a rural community and is, you know, I don't know, fairly liberal, uh, I believe that we should be investing in infrastructure. I believe we should be investing in education. I believe we should be using our government to do things to make people's lives better to do things collectively that we can't simply do individually. I think we should be actively pursuing those things. Um, I don't see the massive divide and there's gotta be a way that we can, we can bridge those divides. Cause I think they're, I think the roadblocks are put in front of us on purpose to keep us divided, to keep us pitted against each other so that we don't wake up one day and realize that, you know what? We got common interests. We got kids that need education. We've got families that need health care. We've got, Kitchen tables that need food on it. We've got houses that need people to live in it. We've got we've got common interests, uh, and I think the sooner we heal some of our divides, cross some bridges, and maybe I don't know, begin to talk to each other again, maybe some of our political di- problems will go away. And that's why I've asked Joe Shepard to come talk with us. Joe is the founder of United Rural Democrats. UnitedRuralDemocrats.org is their website. His goal. To do some of that, let's, hey, let's start talking about rural issues. Let's talk about healing those divides. Let's talk about, well, common interest in making lives better. Joe, thanks for taking time for us. My pleasure, Rick. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I am good. So real, real quick, what what is United Rural Democrats and, and why did why'd you start this? So I worked a couple campaigns in 2020 when I was still in college. I'm actually still a junior at Iowa State. And it was very clear to me after working those two campaigns in Iowa and Wisconsin that there was something fundamentally wrong with the country and how are people reacting to its government and its just general system. So I took it upon myself to travel 110,000 miles since the 2020 election. And I've interviewed people in 45 or 46 states trying to figure out what the heck is going on. What is this malaise and what is the cost of it? And what, I've came, what it's come down to for me is that a lot of people feel like nobody cares about them anymore. And it has allowed some of our darkest elements as humans to take hold. And I think there's no better evidence of that than the rise of Donald Trump over the past eight or so years. Yeah. No, I mean, look, you, the, the reality is, is, you know, we've like, like you, I've traveled this country and been to rural communities across the country where, you know, back in the, and when I was a kid, you know, they had a factory, they had an image, they had an identity, uh, they, they had, the town was this, this manufacturing plant, and, and that has been stripped from them, and they've been left with nothing, and, well, they've been left to languish, and a government that, that doesn't seem to care, and I, I point to, a, you know, a representative in Ohio when he was asked, uh, hey, you know, well, can you help, help us with our, 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 our town, the, the, the jobs have left, what should we do, and the guy goes, move! And you go, no, that's not the answer you want from your, your government. Um, and I guess not surprising he was a Republican. Not at all. Um, a little anecdote I always like to tell people is that, you know, the Republican Party, they have nothing in terms of an agenda right now, aside from being divisive and bigoted. Because I worked as a clerk at the Iowa legislature this session, and you might have seen the news about our transgender sports bill that was just a, it was just state-sanctioned bullying. But what you may not have known is at the same time, I believe the same day, a bill that would have gut food stamps for 99% of Iowans also was put up. Now, that vote gratefully died, but it shows that they're trying to use this culture war to push a sinister agenda that not only hurts marginalized communities, but will hurt everyone. And this is the part that I think is, is most important because... You know, I've argued for a very long time that right wing talk radio, the dominant talk radio in this country, overwhelmingly, you know, 
you know, there was a study done a couple of years ago that 90 percent of talk radio in this country is is of the right wing conservative fashion. Uh, their model is based on on pitching the outrage candy. You know, you got these chaos merchants who just keep slamming this stuff, you know, the transgender stuff down people's throats. And they never bother with the follow up that you just put out there. The fact that while they're pushing the outrage candy, they're literally trying to starve families and, and, and children and all of this. That's the outrageous part to me. And this is where I think the other shoe has to fall, where you have to talk to people and explain, look, you know, there's the outrageous stuff that you know, may get you all fired up, but this should get you even madder. The fact that we're going to literally take food off the, off the tables of children, that's what gets me more upset than anything. I absolutely agree. And after interviewing a lot of people, I think that the conclusion I came to was that a lot of people simply feel like nothing matters anymore. There's almost a degree of nihilism in a lot of these communities that like, my children are going to have a worse future than me. And there's absolutely nothing I can do about it because my local leaders, Democrat or Republican, don't care, although most often Republican. So how do we how do we begin to change that, Joe? Because look, I'm I'm somebody who believes that that we while we still can, we have the power the, to vote. We have the power to change things. We can make different choices. I I still believe that to my core. If I didn't, well, I I would probably be nihilistic, and I would probably be one of those folks. And it doesn't matter. Let's tear everything down and and re, restart. Um, how how do we how do we how do we begin that? This almost sounds reductive, but I think we have to sort of normalize what a Democrat is. Because when I visit communities, oftentimes they'll say that Democrats are gun-grabbing baby killers who want to do this and that. It's like, no, I just, I want you to have health care. I want you to have a good paying job and I want your family to have a good education. I think we need to do two things and they're intertwined. We need to get back into these communities. And I know it's going to be hard because I know a lot of them are hostile territory these days, but we need to make it clear to people that even in communities that are 40% Democrat, you would think the Democrats are like dinosaurs. They didn't, they existed at one point, but they don't exist now. What we need to do is get back out into these communities and make the Democrats like the Kiwanis at the Lions Club at the local church, just another community within the community. That's how the Republican Party took over at the local level over the course of the last 40 years. They just became part of the community in rural areas because before the 1980s or 1990s, the Democrats in much of the country were sort of the baseline political party for the largely apolitical. No, I, I don't disagree with you. And it's something I've been saying, oh, I don't know, almost every day that I've been doing this program for the last 17 years, that you have to get in there and you have to fight where the fight is, which is why, you know, our program is in a lot of rural communities. And, and people go, well, why, why do you do your program from one of the reddest areas in the country? Because this is where it needs to be heard most. This is where we have to have these conversations. This is where you have to have a pro-labor message and talk about wages, hours, conditions. You need to talk about how we're going to move forward and make lives better. And because and for me, you know, a lot of these issues, Joe, it's not right or left. It's it's not a Democratic or a Republican issue. It's 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 up down. It's it's wealthy versus the rest of us. And what's happened over the years is we've created an environment where wealth inequality in this country, which I think is the biggest problem that we've got facing us, is grown bigger and more more all encompassing. And at some point, it's going to be our downfall. I absolutely agree. I think that one issue I've seen. And it goes back to why a lot of people gravitate towards Donald Trump. I think that after talking to so many people who voted for President Trump after being lifelong Democrats, it's clear that like Donald Trump is what a lot of people envision a rich person to be. You know, I think one thing that a lot of people who are in politics sometimes forget is a lot of working class people, they may resent the rich, but everyone wants to be rich. Sure. And I think that we have to make sure that you know, you can climb that ladder, but when you get to the top, you're not pulling it up with you. And I think that that kind of old, I think that's a line from Tom Harkin even, we have to make that our message again, because, you know, we can't, we can't keep doing what we're doing. No. And, and so what do you say to that? Cause look, you know, I, I, I've got a lot of friends who are, you know, died in the world, you know, Trump supporters. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, you know, baby killer gun grabber that, uh, and, and then, and then all of the culture war stuff. Um, because it's what they've been spoon fed. Um, how do you then, how do you bring back that messaging? 
because look, I'm I'm not going to walk away from uh, the the LGBTQ community. I'm not going to walk away from from race relations. I'm not going to walk away from some of the other things that that the Republicans beat Democrats up for, uh, because I do believe in in life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. I believe in equality for everyone, not just a select few. How do you how do you bridge those those d- gaps and those divides in in a moment where hypernationalism, you know, white supremacy seem to be the Republican mantra and and seem to be very pervasive in, in rural America? Or is that too generalizing, do you think? I think the key is trust. I think that at this moment in time, we are running out of time to fix this issue in rural areas. But I think the major key is that there are still some people in local and state leadership in very Trump areas. I know, for example, the state of Pennsylvania has some state reps who are Democrats who represent Trump plus 30 or 40 districts. And that's not because the people of those districts view them as a Democrat. It's because they trust them and they know them as their guy or their gal. And I think what we really need to do is focus on those local levels. Because if you look at polling, your local elected officials, you know, your city council and your mayor, all those guys have a lot better approval ratings than Congress or even state legislators. So I think what we need to do is build up from the bottom, grassroots. We need more, you know, city councilors, county commissioners, mayors, uh, whatever local position your community may have. And I think that once we know that, you know, this guy is going to do right by the people, this person is going to be looking out for me, then we can more easily bridge those gaps because that person's already trusted. It's not some out of town or pushing a new idea. It's Bill from up the street who you've known for 20 years and you trust. And I think that if you have trusted leaders in your communities who are able, those are the people who must and can bridge those gaps still. And we need more of them. And I think, you know, to anyone listening, I think the first step is to, you know, either build local party infrastructure or run for office at the, you know, local level yourself, because that's what we need right now. Yeah. We need more trusted guides to these communities because the culture divide is just getting worse over time. No, and, and that's where groups like yours, United Rural Democrats, and if you want to check out uh, the, the website for Joe Shepard's group, UnitedRuralDemocrats.org, we'll get links out on social media how you can do that. Uh, this is where your group comes in and, and can, can be helpful in this. Is, is that the, the goal of what you're doing? Absolutely. The goal is twofold. One is to organize. In the past year and a half, we've reached approximately 300,000 voters in states like Louisiana, South Dakota, and Oklahoma. But more recently, we've been focusing on fundraising because there are a lot of great candidates out there who love and understand their communities, but they are unable to compete because they simply don't have the funds to compete. And what we have to do, I always tell this story to people, you know, in Iowa in the 1880s and 1890s, the farmers had a populist uprising because they were angry they couldn't afford to get their goods on the train to the markets out east to sell their goods. Right. So they had economic problems and they weren't able to do it. What we need to do now is bring donor dollars, democratic dollars, back into the heartland to make sure these candidates can compete. Because, you know, we can spend $10 million on a Senate campaign. That's just one senator. We can flip a state house seat or a state Senate seat for forty dollars to $100,000, depending on the state. And every single one of those people is another brick in the wall. Because right now, the state legislatures are the laboratories of autocracy in this nation. So that's our hope. And in the last quarter, we gave approximately $10,000 to candidates, particularly in the state of Iowa. And we hope to do more this quarter and beyond. Yeah, no, this plays into, you know, you brought up something that's kind of a sore spot for me. uh, Because I look at some of what Democrats do with, with fundraising, and it's insane. Uh, You know, you look at some of the high profile, you know, Jamie Harrison ran against Lindsey Graham and he was never going to he was never going to unseat Lindsey Lindsey Graham. And and they raised I was like, you know, a hundred million dollars or some outrageous number that could have been used to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, You know, uh, uh, Amy McGrath in Kentucky was never going to take out uh, Mitch McConnell and raise like another hundred million dollars. You think of, of, of that could have been resourced in a in a much more constructive way. We could have been much more competitive in areas across the country and fought the good fight. And look, what you're talking about, you're not Magellan discovering new lands. This is what Gingrich did back in the 90s. So this is just saying, you know what, you got to get in these places where the fight is, ball up your little digits and get in there and throw a couple of punches. Seems sane and rational to me, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. You could actually argue I'm doing the opposite of what Gingrich did in 94 because Gingrich nationalized elections. 
What we're trying to do is get people to focus on what is going on in their community, issues you can see in front of you every single day. So I guess you could say we're trying to undo the Republican revolution. I'm not sure if we're going to succeed, but we're going to try like heck. Yeah, you, you got to do that. The website, unitedruraldemocrats.org. Uh, if folks want to get involved, want to help fund, uh, how do they do that? Can they do that? Absolutely. Um, we accept donations. And uh, if you want to help us in a volunteer capacity, we are, with the exception of a couple helpers, we are all volunteer run. We are youth led and we're a great diverse team. And we'd love to have you as a volunteer or a local, as we call it, our neural network. So we can feel into communities across the country because we're never going to understand everything from our own front porch. Well, Joe, uh, great stuff. I hope folks will check out unitedruraldemocrats.org. Uh, we'll get links out on social media how folks can take a look at that. But fabulous stuff. I hope you'll come back and keep us up to date on what you're doing and, and how this is going and how we can help. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Rick. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. We need more We need more people doing stuff like this. And if you want to run for office and you're in a rural area, highly suggest it. Get out there. Fight the good fight. Uh, again, check out Joe Shepard's gr group, UnitedRuralDemocrats.org, the website. Let's take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk.